Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we find ourselves in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, this time with Ant-Man and the Wasp, directed by Peyton Reed from day one this time. Scott Lang, aka the Ant-Man, played by Paul Rudd, is under house arrest due to the events of Captain America Civil War, and he only has a few days left on his sentence until he can finally journey beyond his front porch. But he suddenly finds himself roped into a crazy scheme by Dr. Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas, and Hope Van Dyne, aka the Wasp, played by Evangeline Lilly. They believe Hope's mother, the OG Wasp, might somehow still be alive in the quantum realm after all these years. And they have built some crazy high-tech gadgetry that just might be able to rescue her. But a slimy black market dealer and the mysterious ghost both want to get their hands on that tech. So Scott must don the Ant-Man suit once again to stop them. So the first Ant-Man was not one of the better Marvel movies, I thought, but it was still plenty enjoyable. It was fun, it had good action, had a good sense of humor, and the de-aging they did to Michael Douglas' face still amazes me. But it was kinda hampered by a mediocre villain and relatively low stakes. Ant-Man and the Wasp is pretty much more of the same. It's not one of the stronger MCU movies, and definitely the weakest one that came out this year after Black Panther and Infinity War. Nevertheless, I did have a lot of fun with it. The action sequences were awesome and inventive and often a bit silly, and I mean that in a good way. It has plenty of funny moments as well, especially the ones involving Luis and his crew of ex-cons. Clearly, they took notice of how well-liked Michael Pena was in the first movie and gave him plenty to do here. Randall Park had some funny moments as kind of a bumbling FBI agent who has to monitor Scott Lang's house arrest. They had a hilarious joke about Baba Yaga, and I also like the kind of self-aware joke that Scott makes about how Dr. Pym and Hope are always putting the word quantum in front of everything. And even though it was spoiled in the trailer, the building shrinking down and then Dr. Pym pulling the handle out of it and using it as a carry-on, that was a pretty good gag. My one complaint though is once he pulled up that handle and then tilted the building, everything inside there that was not nailed down should have gone flying. So the next time they grew it to normal size and went inside, it should have been a fucking mess. And the stuff with Scott and his daughter Cassie was totes adorbs. That's what the kids are saying nowadays, right? Totes adorbs? I know what's down with the kids these days. I'm with it. I'm hip. No, I'm not. And while the movie has a lot of the same strengths as the first Ant-Man, it also has a lot of the same problems, namely the villains. There are two villains this time around. There is Sonny Birch, played by Walton Goggins, who is a black market tech dealer of sorts. Basically, your average slimy businessman. And Hannah John Kamen as the mysterious Ghost, a supervillain with the ability to phase in and out of reality. And there's nothing wrong with Goggins or John Kamen's performances. They were fine. I just didn't find either villain to be really all that compelling in the grand scheme of things. Granted, that problem is not exclusive to the Ant-Man franchise. That seems to be an issue with the MCU as a whole. I mean, I know all the villains can't be low-key, but still... There have been more than a couple mediocre ones. For every Killmonger, there's... Um... Whatever the fuck the villain's name was in Thor The Dark World. I really have no memory of that guy at all. And that's kind of the point, isn't it? There's a lot of mediocrity out there. And is it me, or did Michael Douglas really not give a fuck? I mean, he just looked miserable throughout most of this movie and I'm not entirely sure he was acting. This really felt to me like a contractual obligation performance. He is not there because he wants to be, he's there because he signed a multi-film contract. Maybe he's just disappointed that he didn't get to work with Edgar Wright as much as he was hoping, I don't know. And as is the Marvel way, this movie has a mid credit scene and a post credit scene. One of the two is just a very silly scene that doesn't mean a whole lot, it's just fun. And one has implications for the rest of the franchise, and without giving too much away... I'm not sure that one really worked. It's the, the timing. Just, it doesn't seem right. It seems to me like there was a studio mandate to tie this in with the rest of the MCU, but they couldn't really find a good way to do it, so... This is what we ended up with. In the end, for all its faults, it's still an MCU movie and I still had fun with it. And if the MCU is your thing, you'll probably have fun with it too. And that's about it for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Till next time, take care.